Welcome to Three Questions with. I'm Hugo Balta, publisher of the Latino News Network and your host. Three Questions with is a public affairs program elevating the voices and visibility of matters most important to the Hispanic Latino community by speaking with community and industry thought leaders on the social determinants of health and democracy. At a time when we're seeing climate change causing record-breaking heat, massive droughts in some areas, and extreme floods in others, it's never been more important to take action. Residential and commercial buildings that burn fossil fuels such as gas and propane to power heating and cooking are by far the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. In Chicago, these buildings are responsible for the bulk of the city's carbon pollution. The most vulnerable, communities of color, struggle to have a seat at the table in the discussion and debate to remove these emissions from their buildings and ultimately make them healthier to live in. Addressing the public health and climate crisis is the Southeast Environmental Task Force. Yesenia Balcazar is the Senior Resilient Community Planning Manager with SETF. She is our guest today. Yesenia, welcome to the program. Hi, it's great to be here. Let's start with you telling us more about your organization and its mission to promote environmental justice for marginalized communities at the policy level. Starting with a little bit of background on the Southeast Environmental Task Force. So the organization was founded back in 1986. Our founder uh, was Marion Burns, and really her her drive in starting SETF, you know, it, it wasn't with the intention of like, hey, I want to start like a nonprofit EJ Org in the Southeast side to address these issues. She was concerned about a proposed incinerator that was going to be located in her neighborhood. Um, it was supposed to be really adjacent to a park that her kids played at all the time. And she started a small movement, basically, of other concerned residents um, and family members and really other people that were opposing this, this development. And so they were victorious in that fight um, in opposing this. And after that, it just spurred a lot of discussions around really this small group that, that she had started. Um, and they started looking at other elements, you know, in the Southeast side community, really looking at all the industry in the area and questioning why um, in, in a broader scale, you know, not just specific to this one project, but why do we continuously, um, why are we continuously inundated with all this industry, all this pollution, all this burden? It's just, it's almost like once you look at it, from one angle or one development or whatever, it's like, oh my God, there's so much more. And it's almost like it, it never ends. And so really she, considering that and those conversations she was having, she was like, you know, this, there's a need here for us to, to continue doing this work and to really expand our base. And um, so that's how SETF was <laughs> born, yeah. basically, um, was through her. And it's been going strong ever since because it it never ends, right? We're always putting out these fires. We have the title of being an EJ community because, because it's something that we've grown accustomed to. It's what we're slated for. We're slated for utility, you know, all these sorts of facilities that are deemed like a quote unquote, necessary evil, they have to go someplace. And unfortunately, those places tend to be low income, um, predominantly black and brown demographic communities. And so it's, it's a systemic issue. And of course, in order to tackle a systemic problem, it takes a whole lot of work. So SETF really just expanded throughout the years. And it's it's changed so much. I think even very recently, I want to talk about our campaign to stop General Iron that really just, I mean, it was amazing seeing the momentum that that campaign had. Um, it really took off in 2020. It was following, you know, this period of very, a lot of civic unrest, um, 
following the murder of, of George Floyd. I think that really spurred a lot of interest in youth to become civically engaged. And it was a Stop General Iron campaign. This was a fight that began in 2018. And it was it's a proposed relocation of a metal shredder facility in Lincoln Park, so in the north side, um, to be re- relocated to the southeast side. And it's a very infamous metal shredding company in Chicago. They have so many violations. They have explosions from faulty equipment, and it's really just a public health hazard. And so when we got word of this, um, this was back when I was an intern, and we started tackling it kind of the way we normally do, right, with direct action. We had a protest at the site, um, started a petition, um, kind of the usual organizing spiel that you go through once you start a new opposition. And so we had worked on that for a couple years, and then it's like after this period in 2020, we had a lot of youth within the community looking to get involved and to help the community. And um, because they were kind of looking through like, well, are there nonprofits in my area? Are there, are, do these spaces already exist, you know? And, and they found us. Because really when I began interning at SETF, it was predominantly um, a lot of older generations work in there, kind of the same few volunteers day in, day out. But once youth started to really get involved, I mean, they took that campaign by storm and it got national coverage. And, you know, it's really just the way that SETF has evolved has been, I mean, just tremendous to see. But it's yeah, just like kind of went off on a little tangent no, there. No, no, but no. I think yeah. it's a great example. Look, I mm-hmm. think uh, uh, SETF is necessary to galvanize the community, inform the community, uh, certainly give that voice uh, and, and hold power accountable, at, as you mentioned, with General Iron. I want to now go into the second topic mm-hmm. and, and talk a little bit more, uh, a deep dive about specifically the work that you do with SETF in implementing city policies that would require electrification of buildings, not only in the loop in the north side, mm-hmm. but also on the south and west side. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the shifts um, talking about how SETF has evolved is we've, you know, we have our direct actions and organizing, um, but we also do a lot of advocacy work now as well, which involves work on the policy level and working with the city, developing ordinances, um, because these are systemic issues. I mean, I'm of the belief that really policy is a foundational way to, to tackle the problem at its source. And so, of course, we're looking at the, the biggest environmental issue right now, and that has been for a while, is climate change, really. And in the city of Chicago, 60% of greenhouse gas emissions come from our building stock. And so when you look at policy as a way of tackling that, we started having these conversations of like, okay, well, what are the necessary changes that we need to see with our buildings? And from those conversations that emerged, like, okay, well, we need to move to electrification, like 100%. So this ordinance, it's really, it's two prong. And so the first element is it deals with newly constructed buildings in the loop and the north side, you know, as you mentioned. And so the requirement for these newly constructed buildings would be they're 100% electric, um, zero carbon, all that good stuff. You know, that's the less uphill battle in terms of getting this ordinance passed because I mean, in the loop in downtown, we see a whole lot of new development and we see a whole lot, a whole lot of that is already LEED certified buildings. They're already energy efficient. And so it's kind of just like, in a way, the expected next step, like what's like, you know, do the next best thing. So that element of the ordinance is great and good. Um, we never expected to have like much pushback in terms of that. But then comes the issue of existing building stock, right? Um, The communities that hardly ever see new development, and that would be communities like the Southeast Side, like Little Village, South and Southwest Side communities, right? And so, of course, because their frontline communities are the most impacted by climate change and because they see such 
little development. It's rare to see newly constructed buildings in these areas. We thought, okay, we need to have another element of this ordinance that would then cover, right, this demographic, these parts of the city. And so then that leads to the development of a building performance standard. And so very true to the name, it's a mandate that um, existing buildings would be required to perform by like a, a standard, right? And so essentially what that would look like for existing building stock would be that they, they're they retrofitted. Of course, at, at the state that they're in now, they're not able to be completely electric, um, but that they would have certain advancements that would make them more energy efficient. And of course, with old building stock, there's a whole lot of other issues going on with them besides that. And so another element of this building performance standard would be that we, um, if these buildings have lead paint, you know, that that's taken care of. If it needs new windows, that that's, you know, taken care of and that that's not a burden placed on the residents or the tenants of that building, right? That that's taken care of by the city um, because there's a mandate in place that requires buildings to perform at that certain standard. So, yeah, those are really the two elements of that. Yeah, and and I think it's a process. You know, we, we've we seen the same challenges in regards to changing pipes that mm -hmm. um, that uh, historically uh, on the on the south side, on the west side, it's taken longer to, to change those pipes right. that we know based on studies after studies are harming uh, children and particularly because of the lead in the water. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the north side and some of the, the the changes in, in converting those pipes, it, it's been much more assertive in making those changes. And I think to your point, yeah. um, that same approach of, of, or sense of urgency needs to be done um, mm -hmm. in converting buildings and making sure that, that they're not harming the inhabitants of those buildings. Now, we talked briefly before off camera about Mayor Brandon Johnson mm -hmm. and and you you shared a little a little bit about being hopeful in regards to this administration really doing something with EJ with environmental justice and um, uh, really eliminating some of the barriers yes. that communities especially on the on the south side on the west side have encountered in regards to improving their quality of life can you share a little bit more about about that and your optimism yeah absolutely um so it was around three weeks ago that um, we actually had a press release with Mayor Brandon Johnson where he was introducing the Cumulative Impacts Ordinance. And this is an ordinance that um, the Chicago Environmental Justice Network has been working on developing for the past couple of years. Really, it's just such a huge thing because it's it's tackling the issues from its source again, right? It's really looking at all of the burdens that these communities face from a public health perspective, from an affordability perspective, from a disinvestment perspective. So when we talk about cumulative impacts, it's everything, right? It's all the issues that people are facing and really pointing that light um, on how intentional that it's it's really been. Uh, we've been targeted by by the city, really, um, in the past to just be slated as these places to to just house all this industry, all this pollution, all this burden. And so Mayor Brandon Johnson is really the first mayor that we've seen in such a long time be so willing to work with us and be so determined Um to push this this ordinance along because then it forces the city to confront these burdens that they're placing on these communities, the fact that they are disproportionate, and to change it, really. And so it's it's ongoing. Um, the policy, the ordinance is still um, continuously being developed to be the best that it can be to take into account all communities that are impacted by it, because not all communities that are impacted by these issues in the city of Chicago are deemed environmental justice communities, um, but we still want to make sure that those are accounted for as well, right? Um, but the fact that he's been such a proponent of it is really just, I mean, it's huge. 
It's some, yeah. yeah. So, so off to a good start. And we, yes. we, I'm, I'm sure SETF and we at Illinois Latino News will make sure we take a look at how this progresses and, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, what the responses to environmental justice will be from this administration. Yeah. You've been watching Three Questions with Yesenia Balcazar, Senior Resilient Community Planning Manager with Southeast Environmental Task Force. When we come back, Yesenia is going to talk to us about her lived experiences as a, as a Southsider and how it influences and inspires the work that she does. I'm Jamira Alexander, inviting you to join me for the next public narrative, A Word, on storytelling through art. It's been said art is a way of life, and that is definitely the case for us in Chicago and for my special guests, Kahari Blackburn, Kari Black, and Dorian Sylvain. Join the conversation Thursday, November 30th at 7 p.m. on CanTV Cable Channel 19, streaming on CanTV.org and the CanTV Plus app. We've been talking to Yesenia Balcazar, Senior Resident Community Planning Manager with Southeast Environmental Task Force, about how the environmental nonprofit organization is dedicated to serving the southeast side and south suburbs of Chicago by promoting environmental education, pollution prevention, and sustainable development. Now we're going to get a chance to learn more about you as a, a Southsider, you know, born and raised. Tell us about your upbringing. Tell us about your lived experiences and how that's influenced the work that you do today. We did chat a little bit off camera about this. Um, but ultimately, I, I, my upbringing was, like so many of my peers, um, we've all were pretty blissfully unaware that our community really looked any different to any other <laughs> communities. And so um, I think, I mean, one of the beautiful things about the Southeast side too, though, is while we do have all this industry, we also have a lot of green space. And um, I grew up just really being obsessed with our natural areas, specifically um, Eggers Forest Preserve. I just... It's still probably one of my favorite places ever to go to and decompress. But because I've always had this love for natural spaces growing up, I've always been interested in, in preserving our environments. And of course, with my generation, I think we were the first ones to really be inundated with the fact that our natural spaces were threatened um, by human activity, by climate change, by you know all these things. Um, it was my senior year of high school where I took an AP environmental science course and I learned about um, the concept of sustainability and just fell in love with it, right? Because it was absolutely centered on um, preserving these spaces for generations to come. And so when I was 18 and I was going through the rounds of picking the college that I wanted to attend, I was automatically drawn to Roosevelt University because they had a whole major surrounded on sustainability studies. And I was like, oh my God, like that's it. Let's go. This is this is what I want to do. And it wasn't until college and going through this program that I learned about environmental justice. And um, I remember the director of, of uh, the sustainability studies major, you know, having a conversation with him and, and him telling me, he's like, well, you know, you live in an EJ community. And I didn't. <laughs> I was just, um, you know, I, I told him that. I was like, I had no idea. And he seemed a little, you know, taken aback by it. And um, really, that's what started opening my eyes then to, um, we were talking about how I would, you know, commute on the metro um, from home to downtown. And so I'm, I started opening my eyes to all these other neighborhoods that I was passing through and really realizing just how different they looked from my own, um, you know, and that was just very jarring to realize. And so when we had like one of my courses had an entire unit on environmental justice and really talking about um, how this issue came to be and just really realizing how intentional it was through zoning, through city policy, through, through all of those decisions being made by, you know, the higher powers that be, I guess you could call it, right, by government. Um, and so it was just 
it made me angry. It was, I mean, I remember that being the prime emotion that I felt learning about this and really thinking about my community in a whole new light. And I just, I knew that I had to keep going forward in this work. I knew like, this is, this is the area that I need to delve into. It was honestly through my, my last semester of undergrad where um, that director, he pointed me to the Southeast Environmental Task Force as well. And he's like, you know, there's already an entity that exists within your community that's tackling these issues. And so I was really one of the first few youth um, within the community to get involved with SETF, right? We talked earlier about how it went through this kind of transformative process of being um, mostly older generations, the elderly demographic within the community to shifting um, to more youth and more youth being interested in the program and really fighting for our community, fighting for its vitality, for it. We see its potential, right? And I think a lot of people tend to get used to like the status quo or they say like things are how they are. It's always been this way. It's just like that. But really, I think when you bring youth perspective into it, we challenge that a lot, right? Where it's like, no, that's not okay. Why don't we deserve more? Why don't we deserve to look like these other communities? Why does it have to stay this way? And it doesn't. It absolutely doesn't. Um, and so really that's that's how um, my own self-interest ties into this work because I, I was unaware. And I talked to, you know, my fellow organizers that are my age that grew up in the Southeast side and they're also, they'll tell you the same thing. Like I had no idea. I thought it was normal and that's not a lot of people's normal and it shouldn't be really. So that's great. And I, I think that's one of the, th the more admirable things about you that you, 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 your eyes were open to the situation that, as you said, was normal for you, right. and you you took that anger and you channeled it in the right way through SETF, and stayed right. And, mm -hmm. and, and instead of leaving um, your situation or your neighborhood, you you doubled down on your community, and you're leading very important work that is not only helping you, but helping your neighbors and our community. So I, I absolutely commend you for that. Yesenia, thank you so much for your time and for your insights. Thank you so much, Hugo. It's been a pleasure. Uh, you've been watching uh, uh, Yesenia Balcazar, Senior Resilient Community Planning Manager with Southeast Environmental Task Force. When we come back, la última palabra, the last words on environmental justice. Joining me on the next episode of Every Day is a Yay is Sarah Briggs. I cannot keep giving 150%. I am going to burn out. The energy I give in, what energy am I getting back? Yeah. And can I put in all of this energy? Join the conversation Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. on Can TV Cable Channel 19 and streaming on CanTV.org and the CanTV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. And now, la última palabra, the last word on environmental justice. Latinos in the United States are likely to live in areas with poor air quality and higher pollution levels. According to a study by the Union of Concerned Scientists, Latino children are 40% more likely to die from asthma-related complications than non-Hispanic white children. This disparity can be attributed to several factors, including proximity to highways, industrial facilities, and power plants often emitting harmful pollutants. Additionally, Latino communities are often exposed to pesticides and other toxic chemicals due to their overrepresentation in agriculture and low-wage industries. Agricultural workers, many of whom are Latino, face direct exposure to harmful chemicals leading to increased health risks such as respiratory problems, cancer, and birth defects. Access to clean and safe drinking water is a fundamental human right, yet many Latino communities face challenges in obtaining this essential resource. In both urban and rural areas, Latinos are more likely to live in areas with contaminated water sources, such as outdated infrastructure or proximity to industrial waste disposal sites. 
environmental racism, perpetuates systemic inequalities, and places an unfair burden on the community. Latinos often face barriers to accessing environmental resources and participating in decision-making processes. Language barriers, socioeconomic disparities, and limited representation in environmental organizations and governmental bodies hinder their ability to advocate for their community's environmental concerns effectively. In the article, From One Mayor to the Next, Polluted Communities Still Dealing with Life and Death, Illinois Latino News reporter Luis Kim reports that while Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson is promising to dismantle environmental racism, distressed residents in Pilsen are apprehensive. Community members from Pilsen and some of the most polluted areas in Chicago gathered at a public hearing on October 3rd to express their concerns about the Cumulative Impact Assessment, or CIA. Many criticized the study's emphasis on census tracts that exclude specific neighborhoods from being considered environmental justice neighborhoods. While the CIA is the first of its kind in Chicago, activists remain wary of where the study is headed. As Alfredo Romo, executive director of Neighbors for Environmental Justice said, now comes the hard part. We must hold the city departments accountable to the promises they made in their environmental justice action plans, promises made to the people of Chicago. So how can we achieve environmental justice? The Latino climate justice framework has some ideas, among them, advance clean, renewable, community-based energy, advance clean mobility, transportation, and shipping. Concerning protecting vulnerable communities from the climate crisis, they recommend building climate-resilient communities, providing equitable access to clean water, protecting farm workers from climate threats, and assisting and resettling climate refugees. I invite you to read their report defining clearly the climate problems Latinos face and presenting actionable solutions. And that does it for this edition of Three Questions With, a collaboration by Illinois Latino News and Can TV. LNN is dedicated in best serving Hispanic Latinos with local multimedia news and information websites across the U.S., including Illinois Latino News, a statewide community focused initiative. I invite you to look us up on our websites and chat with us via social media. Tell us what you think about the topics we talked about today, and please send me suggestions about what you think we should talk about in the future. Because at the Latino News Network, you're more than just our audience. You are our contributors. Thank you very much for watching.